Thank, Thank you. you. Trails to tracks to paved roads. We're talking about the history of how people moved in this area. Here's a map of the original trails that were known in the 1850s. The top trail by the word Wolfsfeld is County Road 6. County Road 6 was originally a trail that went from St. Anthony Falls all the way out to the Crow River where the town of Watertown is today, where you can cross because of the shallow rapids. If you're familiar with Rockford Road, County Road 9, that was the same kind of Native American trail from St. Anthony Falls out to where Rockford is today because again, there was a shallow crossing point in the Crow River. And you can see that County Road 6 also came down and went right through Wyzetta and Long Lake. That was called the South Watertown Road. And they meet up out past the Tamarack Post Office and continue on to what's now Watertown. Uh, the two north-south trails, one of those trails is now County Road 19. Comes up from Shakopee through Excelsior, across the Narrows, and right up past Lakeview Golf Course. And you can see it coming right here along the side of North Arm. Now, you don't go on County Road 19 today. If you'll notice County Road 19, past the west side of Lakeview Golf Course, is very straight and does this. That's a new road. Back in the days of people walking and horses, they hated doing this. Horses hate pulling a wagon down a hill because the wagon pushes against them, they want to run, and the driver has to pull back on the reins and pull on the brake to keep the wagon from running away down the hill. The old road went along the east side of Lakeview Golf Course and came around. The other main north-south trail was Highway 101. If you remember back in the days when you used to drive down to Shakopee and you went down 101. It was a curvy winding road from Wyzetta all the way down around to Shakopee. That was the other Native American trail. And if you were down in Shakopee and went to Murphy's Landing, now called the Landing, as you went down there, on the east end of that property is where the original Chief Shakopee village site was. So they crossed the river, followed the trails, and keep in mind, the trails went through the woods. If you walk in Wolfsville Woods in the fall, a beautiful time to do it, the trail was wide enough for a person or a person with a horse to navigate. The trails were narrow. There weren't signs. There was no GPS. They didn't pull out your phone to figure out where you were going. You had to just follow the trail through the woods. And the trails were used not only by the Native Americans, but also by the animals that traveled from place to place. Um, excuse me. Now, this is one of the families that settled along the Watertown Road Trail. This house is still standing today, and the descendants of this family are still living in the house. This is the house of Gustav Johnson. His, uh, I think it's his great grandson is Marvin Johnson, the perpetual mayor of independence. His family came in the early 1850s and built the part of the house where you see the chimney originally, and then it's been added onto. And Marvin lives in that house today at 80 some years old. And you can see that um, they're dressed a little differently than we are today. <laughs> independence. You can see in Independence, when the railroad comes through, the Maple Plain over on the far side, Lake Independence up there, Independence Township, here's County Road 6 coming through. Here's Gustav Johnson's place right here. And you can see a few of those Native American trails became the roads going through various townships. And these are the original 1879 
names of who owned the properties then. Minnetrista, Halsteads Bay, Lake Langdon, and there's all, Tom, there's, there's Mr. Cook up there, your neighborhood. Harrison's Bay, Dutchman's Lake. You can see the couple trails coming through and the one coming across. Of course, the trails went around wetlands. They went around hills. They traveled on the easiest route to travel if you're walking or using a horse. Up in Medina, again, Medina included, the Medina Township in 1879 included Long Lake, Wolfsfeld Woods, and the tracks coming through. We'll talk about the railroad in a minute. And again, here's the trail coming through for South Watertown Road, North Watertown Road. You can see them all coming together to provide the pioneers access. Now, if you didn't live on those trails, you had to wander through the woods to find where your 160 acre homestead was. Now, how many of you could wander through the woods and figure out where your homestead was today? It would be a real challenge. The big change comes when in 1867, in June, a steam engine train pulls into the lakeshore in Wyzetta. And the Governor Ramsey, which was already built and running on Lake Minnetonka, is there to meet the train. Now, the Governor Ramsey could run all the way down to Minnetonka Mills. That's where the dam was. And there was actually a bay out in front of the Burwell House where the Governor Ramsey could turn around and come back up Minnehaha Creek to Lake Minnetonka. So the boat was there first, then comes the train. And with the train for pioneers, no longer having to build log cabins, they could buy cut lumber, no longer using elm tree bark for shingles on your log cabin. You could get cedar shake, cedar sawn shingles for your log cabin. No longer having to build a chimney out of field stone, you could have bricks. All the pioneer log cabins in this area did not have fireplaces because by the 1850s, everyone could afford a simple metal box stove. So the chimney always came down the middle of the log cabin, about halfway to the floor on the main floor, with a stovepipe going up to it and a square box stove. And the box stove was much easier for cooking on and also much more efficient for heating. But with the train came something else dependable daily mail service. Before that, a stagecoach ran from St. Anthony out to the new town of Watertown. Mr. Lewis was involved in creating that. And it came twice a week. And it stopped at various points, stagecoach stops along the road. But if you look back in the archives, you can see where those stops were. But you got your mail twice a week. Think about staying in touch with your family, where the mail leaves twice a week and takes a month or two months to get to whatever family member you're talking about, wanting to talk to, and a month or two months to get back to you again. Our instant communication is amazing. Here comes the train to give you an idea of what it looked like. And I love the bicycle. The steam engine train coming around the Carson's Bay Bridge down in Deep Haven. Beautiful steam engine number seven on this Minneapolis and St. Louis. But the bicycle sitting next to the tracks. Now, if the train has anything sticking out, that bicycle is going to go for a ride down the tracks right off the bridge.
And of course, the Wayzata Depot, 1906. This was the third depot in Wayzata. The first one was right in front of the sunsets on the lake now, the Cove restaurant where that parking lot is at the bottom of Broadway. The second one was down across the road from the Wayzata Yacht Club next to the Humpback Railroad Bridge that finally opened up this year. And the third one was 1906 right in downtown Wayzata. This was an exciting addition that railroads brought. Not only did the railroads bring your mail, bring your building materials, they also brought the things that were sold in the stores, and they also brought family and friends. You could now travel from Wyzetta, the train stop, and you can see this is a passenger train. Buy your ticket at the depot. And by the way, the Wyzetta Historical Society has the depot open most weekends through the fall. And hop on the train, go to Chicago, New York, St. Louis, Kansas City, go the other direction out to Seattle and Portland. It was amazing what you could do by just hopping on the train. But you'll notice a standpipe there for putting water in the steam engine. Steam engines have to have water every so often because they boil it away. And that depot also was a big thrill in Wyzetta because it was the first building with central heat. They put a boiler in the basement. The basement floor in the building is actually brick, paving brick. They also, it was the first building with flush toilets. In 1906, nobody in Wyzetta had a flush toilet. They had an outhouse and a chamber pot but a flush toilet, oh. And it had the first public drinking fountain. One little thing to keep in mind, in 1906, they figured the lake was so big that when you flushed the toilet, the pipe went into the lake. And when you drank from the drinking fountain, the water came from Wyzetta Bay, The germ theory was not commonly known back then. One of those little quirks about the depot that doesn't get talked about very much. You have to understand the railroad as it came through on the main line all the way out to Wilmer, Litchfield and up to Benson. The railroad picked where the towns were gonna be. The railroad picked the post offices. And if you're confused today why there's a post office in Crystal Bay, where there's no delivery from it. Why is there a post office in Navarre with no delivery from it? You can, you can rent a, a mailbox because the railroad brought the mail and they picked where the mail was going to be and that's where the post offices were. The railroad also named a lot of the towns. Wyzetta's name was already there. Long Lake's name was already there. Maple Plains name was already there, but Delano Delano was named for one of the English investors in the St. Paul and Pacific Railroad, also known as now the Great Northern or the BNSF. English investors also named the following towns going out to Wilmer, Dassel, Darwin, Litchfield, Atwater, and Wilmer were all named for investors in the railroad. So had you been an investor in the St. Paul Pacific, you could have a town named after you just like the pioneers who settled around Lake Minnetonka got to name some of the bays on Lake Minnetonka, the Maxwells, the Stubbses, the Browns, the Smiths, kind of nice. Building the railroads was a challenge. This is the Turnham building crew in about 1915 building the bed for the loose line tracks through Stubbs Bay. The first team of horses essentially acted like a plow to loosen up the dirt. And the succeeding horses ended up with a grater in the back end, grading it smooth. Railroad tracks up through the 1920s followed the lay of the land. For the St. Paul and Pacific, the worst set of tracks was between Wyzetta and Delano because if you follow Highway 12, you know that the land goes up and down and up and down and up and down. As the train would go up and down those rises and drops, the couplings would sometimes come loose and half the train would be going one way and the other half would be going the other way. 
it was a real challenge back in those days. And building railroad tracks was smooth out the dirt, lay down the ties, and start building. The loose line was in a, a unique line. It was supposed to be electrified, much like the streetcar lines. There were supposed to be power lines over the entire length of it. But since the railroad company did not have enough money to pay for that, they bought gasoline electric cars, the first hybrids, actually. This car was an electrically driven rail car. This was the engine baggage car, mail car, and passenger car all in one. And it had a gasoline motor that ran the generator that powered the electric trucks on the car. The kids in the day called it the putt-putt train. So if you're walking the loose line and you hear putt-putt-putt-putt-putt-putt, watch out, the train's coming. It didn't have that chugga-chugga-woo-woo. The loose line had putt-putt-putt-putt-putt from those one-lung gasoline engines. And if you've played with those, you'll know what I'm talking about. Of course, there were beautiful steam engines in the 30s. This is the Great Northern steam engine 1950 at the station in Long Lake. And look at the pile of coal on the far right side there to fire up that huge engine. This was a train going all the way to Seattle. You know why kids in the 20s and 30s dreamed of being an engineer on a train. You could see him, you could wave at him, and of course, blowing the whistle was the best job of all. Look at the beautiful road down here at the bottom. Two tracks going over a beautiful little bridge. Many of you have been on this very road over a successor to that little bridge. This is the bridge on County Road 15 at Tanninger Lake. This was the first bridge they built there when the road was one lane going around the lake shore. Tanninger Lake, you know. Tanger Lake Bridge, just before you get to Brackett's Point. Yeah, Mud Lake for those of us who've been around for a while, yes. But look at the beautiful little bridge, a nice little wooden bridge. The railroads also required bridges over the tracks as often as possible. For instance, when Mound got the railroad in 1900, they were having five to six trains a day come through Mound, and on the weekends there would be 12 to 15 trains bringing people out from the cities. Having railroad crossings that were bridges were much safer for people with their horse and wagon and later with cars. Hard to imagine right in front of the water is Watertown Road leading towards Brown Road and Long Lake. The new Highway 12 is up, would be up here on your left. Uh, if you continue down to your right, that's where you would cross Brown Road and Long Lake. And three of those houses are still there. Uh, the middle one the, with the one peak of roof and the one little one down there with the four windows you can see in it and the, or the three windows in the door. Those houses are still there. They've been remodeled, added onto, but they're still there sitting along Watertown Road from the 1870s. Sure. Yeah, you want me to go backwards. I'm not good at that. <laughs> Just a second. I got it now. Yeah, this house, no, the house over here, because I'll, I'll shrink it down. 
This house is still there, and that house is still there. But the thing to notice, this was the big woods in 1860, and by the early 20th century, guess what? The big woods is gone. Now if you drive down here again, all that hillside is all wooded again. For those of you who re remember Dr. Simsch, the pediatrician in Wyzetta, he lived in that house right back up here. Is that enough, Carol? Yeah. Okay. Anybody recognize where this is? This is Ferndale Road right across from Meyer Brothers Dairy going south. This is what it looked like in the 19 teens. It was the one way to get around the lakeshore. There was no road that followed the tracks. Because that, if you got past Highcroft School, it's all swamp. And you'll know that they've had a heck of a time taking the dips out of it as it keeps sinking in the swamp. So the original road went all the way around through Ferndale, came back to Orno Orchard, and then you could go up Orno Orchard towards Long Lake, or you could continue around over the Tanager Lake Bridge and get all the way over to Minnetonka Beach. Before the road bridge was in at Minnetonka Beach, the railroad bridge was there. And if you felt daring, you could sneak across the railroad bridge with your horse and buggy. And if the water was low, you could actually go through the channel with your buggy kind of floating as you went across that deepest part to get over to Minnetonka Beach. Otherwise, to get to Minnetonka Beach, you had to go all the way around the far side of Crystal Bay, coming back around through Navarre and then going to Minnetonka Beach. Life has gotten a lot easier. These ladies, and you have to be kind of old to remember, there used to be a bridge in Maple Plain at the end of Main Street where you crossed over the railroad tracks and then continued over to County Road 83. These ladies are traveling the bridge just before it was torn down in 1931 on Dr. Wilkins, who was a mound physician, his original doctor's buggy. Think about the doctor did visits to your home when you were sick. You didn't go to see the doctor, the doctor came to see you. Just think, no waiting in the waiting room uncomfortably. The doctor came to you, had to watch out for the quarantine signs that he kept in the back of his buggy in case you had measles, smallpox, or something else. He put those up on your door and nobody went in or out of your house. Dr. Wilkins was the mound physician. And that was how he got around in the day. Another fun one. It says it right there. This is County Road 19. Look at the smooth road bed. A reminder that there were three kinds of roads. There was a dirt road, which is what this is. You graded and scraped the dirt. In the spring, it was soft and muddy. Everybody got stuck in their horse and wagons. In the fall, it dried out and hardened up. In the winter, there was a nice packing of snow on it. And they would actually just pack down the snow so you could take your sleigh on it. A gravel road had people hauling gravel to put on the road. In the early part of the 20th century, to haul gravel, you had a wagon called a dump wagon. A dump wagon had a bottom that was two parts, and the two parts would open up to dump the gravel straight down to, out of the bottom of the wagon, and you'd grab the lever and you'd ratchet the sides back up to go get it filled up. And by the way, the way you filled up the gravel from a gravel pit near the road, grab your shovels. It was all done by hand. See, that's why Tom got so strong. He was, he was shoveling gravel there. But County Road 19, again, many of these houses are still there. Some have been remodeled, but you can still see them even today. And the trees were left there. It wasn't good farmland. And you can see this nice little arbor in the picture there. A nice branch wood arbor. 
Downtown Long Lake, 1913. This is Highway 12. Right up here is where the bank building is in Long Lake today. This road going up the hill here is Brown Road going north towards County Road 6. And as you can see, the road didn't continue west because to go anywhere, you came up to Brown Road and you went north to County Road 6. The livery stable and next door was a meat market. Eventually, August Hale owned both of them. And there's a joke in Long Lake. Did you hear? Charlie's horse died yesterday. Yeah, the meat market's got a special on ground meat today. For all the years we've driven Highway 12, imagine it a dirt road. Imagine how smooth the trip would be in even our modern cars. Yep. Oops. Ah, somebody knows. The Maxwell store, right there on County Road 19 right by the railroad tracks. And you can see the tracks right here at the bottom. Here's, here's one of the rails. And County Road 19 is over here on the far right side. The Maxwell store also was a real estate office. How prophetic. You cannot lose at Lake, at, at Minnetonka. Meaning you can't lose money if you buy a lot on Lake Minnetonka. Wouldn't they be surprised what the lots are going for today? The lots today pay more in property tax than any of us who came in the 50s and 60s paid for the whole lot with a house. And they're doing it with just property tax. Oh my gracious. And I love the clothes on all the people there. Ladies, you're not properly dressed today. Where, where are your dresses? Where are your nice high collars? It's an embarrassment. And gentlemen, where's your suits? This is a lightweight summer wool suit. Think about wearing a wool lightweight, a lightweight wool suit in the summertime. And by the way, swimsuits were all also made of wool in those days. And two great early 20th century cars there, just seeing the back end of them. How do we get across the channels? You talk to a guy like George Turnham. He became much like our retired state senator here. George Turnham was the state senator that represented this North Lake Minnetonka area in his day. And he also is the good looking man there with the hat and the tie on. He and his brother had the road building crew this is the coffee bridge when it was first built over the channel between West Arm and Crystal Bay. And you can see the fancy machinery they had, a gasoline powered cement mixer to pour the concrete, wood forms, and uh, a well-dressed crew. <laughs> yes, complete with neckties. How did they load the wagons? The wagons were loaded. There was a scraper here that would scrape along the dirt and a conveyor belt run by a gasoline engine that would dump the dirt into the dump wagon and the dump wagon would take it away to the farmer's place. And the farmers always had low spots to fill. So they were happy to take away whatever dirt was needed to be removed when road building. And when you were building roads and bridges, you got to sleep on the job. The sleeping sheds with wheels underneath. They brought them with wherever they were working because it was too hard to get back home for the people on the crew. I look at those and go, oh, in the winter, you got a little stove in there to keep you warm. And in the summer, you're warm all the time, even with the windows open. This is one of my favorite pictures I found. We'll scroll down a little bit so you can see. 
This is a Model T from the Delano Ford Company. And you can see that one of the things to publicize what a great car it was, they packed it with all the little kids they could find onto that little car. This is Watertown Road coming up to Stubbs Bay Road, if you remember, coming down the hill. Look at the beautiful road surface, the smooth running road, and of course the Ford Model T. No windshield on this, oh, the windshield's folded down and the top's folded back, but you know, not the warmest car to be in in the wintertime. No heated seats either. In 1928, they surveyed what was then called State Glacier Highway Number 10 to go from Wyzetta to Wilmer and up to Benson. And when they were grading it through Long Lake, this was the team of horses to haul away in 1929 the dirt. And we actually have a steam shovel in 29. Any of you gentlemen old enough to have played with a steam shovel like that when you were a kid? I did. I had my dad's. Steam shovels were amazing. Fill the dump wagon up, pull the lever, drop the bottom out, take the dirt back to your farm. By 1930, they were paving the road through Long Lake with cement. And if you remember the cement road in Long Lake had little Highway 12 had little lips on the side back in the 40s and 50s that if you got too close to the edge, it would thrust you back into the, into the roadway, <laughs> almost causing problems. The truck here, actually, it's a beautiful truck. I mean, you just look at this thing and you go, oh my gracious. All, all of us truck driving fans would love this truck. It brought the sand and gravel to be mixed with the lime for the cement. And in 1930, when they laid that pavement down, it was good for over 30 years without a lot of patching. A little more of the paving process. You can see that once the truck dumped half its load, you can see it's got two loads of gravel in there. Once it dumped half its load of gravel, this bucket would lift up and pour it back into the machine to mix with the cement and the, uh, the lime and water. And there are the forms where they poured the concrete right on the ground. It took a while to get it all done. And of course, while Highway 12 was being paved, Watertown Road was being graded. It was still dirt except for the low spots where they had gravel. This is Watertown Road west of Stubbs Bay. Now to answer a few mysteries. First of all, see the number seven right here? And number seven goes all the way back up here to Medicine Lake. That is what we used to call County Road 15. Before that, it was County Road 7. Now, when my family moved out to the lake in 1955, my dad worked at Honeywell in South Minneapolis. And he invited his co-workers to come out to the house on Maxwell Bay. And he gave them directions for coming out Highway 7. I answered the phone. Some guy said, your dad's directions are all wrong. He keeps saying to turn right. I and mean, if we turn right, we're going to be in the lake. <laughs> because they came out State Highway 7 to Excelsior instead of coming out County Road 7 out of Wyzetta. And for those of you who were driving around like Tom Rockvam was, do you remember when it was still County Road 7, Tom? No? OK. Now. We have County Road 84, which goes around 
from Nuremberg's property all the way around Stubbs Bay and comes all the way over and meets up with County Road 19. 19 comes down from Maple Plain, comes around and meets down here and continues on down through, and this again, the old Indian Trail all the way down through Excelsior and then down from there. 101 you can see was a state highway, went all the way up from almost to Dayton on the north end of Hennepin County, all the way down through Wyzetta around. Um, the Grays Bay Bridge was a shallow point in the, in the lake. Originally, you could, you could get across there with horse and wagon. And moving on down, you can see it wiggles and curves. And again, it wasn't made for cars. It was made f for horse and wagon. And the mystery of all. County Road 110, if you'll notice, where County Road 6 crosses U.S. Highway 12, the number County Road 110 is right there at that intersection. Originally, County Road 110 and County Road 6 paralleled from Highway 12 all the way out to this intersection where 83 comes down from Maple Plain and crosses, and here's 110 coming down into Mound. The reason they couldn't rename County Road 83 as County Road 110 was because County Road 110 already crossed Highway 12 back in the 30s. Twenty six going out west. The old maps. The West Tonk Historical Society has them. Why is it Historical Society has them? West Hennepin History Center in Long Lake, we have them. Are amazing to look at and kind of go, huh, that's interesting. And you'll see with County Road 7, the original part went along the lakeshore through Ferndale. The new part went along the tracks in the swamp. If you look at U.S. Highway 12, U.S. Highway 10, going up to St. Cloud, those national highways parallel the railroad tracks. The railroads did the post office, the depots, the hauling the freight, the hauling the passengers, and in the Midwest, determining where a lot of our U.S. highways traveled. They followed the tracks because they went from town to town, and since the railroad established the towns, thereby the tracks were. Yellowstone Trail came out of Excelsior, and you can see it came along originally came along up here, past Howard's Point and back down and around on the other side of Lake Virginia. Now it comes out where three is and comes down and goes across the tracks down over here and comes down and goes out along five. Things have changed over the years. The numbering of the roads and the road beds. One of the nicest things that ever happened was these three brothers agreed to sell some land to the city of Orono. The three brothers are the McCulley brothers. And how many of you take that cutoff from County Road 6 on McCulley Road to get down to 110, or down to 19? McCulley Road cuts right through one of the biggest strawberry fields that used to be in the area, the McCulley Farm, which was uh, multiple generations. I can't think of when it first started, I think back in the 1870s. Graydon, Doug, and Don, after their parents stopped doing strawberries, raspberries, and fruit, they got into the turkey business. Grady McCulley actually gave President Truman a live turkey in honor of Thanksgiving. So he's holding up this bird, flapping its wings in the newspaper article, giving it to the president. Um, they took the Maple Hill Academy building out by Lake Independence and turned it into their turkey hatchery by Baker Park. And the park district still uses one of the buildings that they hatched little turkeys in, uh, and they call it the turkey shed to this day. McCulley's had lots of turkeys, and this time of year, we're all thinking about them. And for our final two pictures, 
a little fun. County Road 110, Downtown Mound, 1937. Here's where County Road 15 comes in, right here. There is the original bank building. What'd you say, Vern? Right there, yep. The turntable for the train to turn around before it went all the way out to, through St. Bonnie out to Hutchinson. And by the way, the Great Northern Depot in Hutchinson has been restored, and it's where they have their Hutchinson's Farmer's Market every week. You'll have to take a tour out there, Vern. Now, the fun part of this picture is that somebody from the West Tonk Historical Society was smart enough to 30 or 50 years later take this picture. 50 years later, downtown Mound, the bank buildings changed, the carpet furniture store is there, Long Paris is there. Now we have stoplights for the intersection. And of course, the depot is gone from around the corner. And the building I miss most from the 60s and 70s is the Mound Bakery. I worked at Camp Christmas Tree, and boy, if we could stop at the Mound Bakery and get a treat on the way to camp while the kids were all singing songs on the bus, it was the highlight of our morning. <laughs> Yeah, Tom. Yeah, the building on the right, which we all knew as Long Bridge, soldiers were back in those days. They have a, I don't know, but 1950, they have a, the pole going up, and maybe that is the thing you can see here. But the red light on top. Yeah, right here, the tall antenna pole. And that was the police pole. Oh, the police, yeah. Tom's talking about in the 50s, this tall pole which was there in 87, was for the police radio. Did you climb it, Tom? No, I didn't. Uh, right up the street was L for uh, the taxi cab. Yep, the taxi cab place, yep. L, L, uh, come on, I'm going to go to the church now. Because you can take taxis from Mound into, into Minneapolis. Was, uh, the guy was a uh, part of the church. And of course, other famous things in Mound in the 80s. Certain Chinese restaurant we all knew and loved. House Amoy. And the pump house, fortunately, that was there from, I don't know what year the pump house was built, but it's still there, nicely restored now. It got moved, but. Do you uh, have any maps that show when they ran Yep. And they changed it to 15 at the same time as when they ran 15 and they went down the beach across the swamp. Yep. Yep. Oh. Originally, the County Road, uh, County Road 7, County Road 15, went up the hill by Kloss's store and, and uh, tavern to come into Navarre by where the Snyder, uh, sort of just on the other side of Culver's. It came in right up there, and that was the original way into Navarre. I think that was in like 50 or 51. When they filled in the swamp. When they filled that in and did that, because the only thing that was Max Keith and that Yeah, Donnie McMahon. Uh, I think he's done right now. For those of you who remember when they built the Highway 12 bypass in Long Lake, and all of a sudden they ran into a problem. And the bypass was done for a couple years before they could find the money to build the land bridge across the swamp behind what us old timers used to call the Isinger's Dump, next to Dumas's apple orchard. This is from the newspaper in 1868. We learned that about 400 yards in length of the new embankment 
of the St. Paul and Pacific Road running across the so-called Stubbs Marsh, four or five miles beyond Wyzetta, and which was 10 to 12 feet in height, sank almost out of sight yesterday. It has settled a number of feet, therefore, but the sudden movement yesterday was quite unexpected and indicates a lack of bottom in the vicinity. Mr. Sullivan, the superintendent in charge of the work, is of the opinion it can be refilled and made substantial without resorting to pile driving. In 1868, they knew that swamp was a bottomless swamp. Do you think over 130 years later, somebody would have read that from the railroad to know that there was a bottomless swamp there? Huh. Because the same thing happened. They dumped the gravel there for the fill and they came back the next day and all of a sudden the gravel had sunk down and they brought more gravel and it sunk down. All of a sudden they realized they had a problem. Had to do something different. <laughs> yeah. The other amazing story is about Mr. James J. Hill. We talk about a man who was arrogant. Mr. Hill had it back in 1883. There is quite a road war between J.J. Hill and the authorities of this town of Orno. The county road runs through Hill's farm. This is where the Minnetonka Art Center is today. For this has been a public thoroughfare for 15 years. For the last Eight months, Mr. Hill has authorized his farmhands to keep the road filled with logs. These obstructions were patiently removed by the roadmaster, only to have them filled up again. As it stands today, there exists a pair of bars and a few gates across the road. Now Mr. Hill expects everyone to put up the bars and close the gate. If this demand is granted, what are our rights? If Mr. Hill can close this county road, he can close any road anywhere. We all know the price of liberty and can understand that the handwriting on the wall, there is no use there that entertains any malice towards Mr. Hill. We all appreciate the efforts he has made to develop the north side of this lake. Still, there are rights that belong to the people that are too sacred to be trifled with. In 1883, the Lafayette Hotel was a big going concern. Mr. Hill owned the property, which was called the Tenney Place, then Kingsley Murphy's Place. Beautiful, beautiful home, one of the most notable homes on Lake Minnetonka. It's still there. It's been remodeled and fixed up, but it's a gorgeous place. No. Kingsley Murphy's house. Kingsley Murphy's house. The brick one with the tower and all that. And Mr. Hill bought that property and that was going to be his farm across the lake from the Lafayette Hotel. He never developed that farm beyond building the barns, which are now torn down, and bought the land up in North Oaks and moved his whole estate to North Oaks. But he was feuding with the community, not wanting them to travel across his farm because he had land on both sides of the road. Ah, yes. And to make you feel more comfortable, the next time you get stuck in rush hour traffic, a little piece about a pioneer pleasure trip. Mrs. Delilah Maxwell took a ride to go into Minneapolis from the east side of Maxwell Bay. She was riding with Mr. French, of which French Lake is named for. She wrote in her diary, as we started down a terrible steep hill, Jerry, the oxen, switched his tail around a young sapling. It was wet with dew and it lapped tight and we were going downhill so fast, something had to give way. It was the tail. 
There was only a stump left, and the ox likely bled to death. Mrs. French kept worrying for fear that wolves would get Jerry's tail. And when we had gone about a mile, she made Mr. French go back and get the tail. We started on again and came to Teepee Hill, which is Union Cemetery in Long Lake, where the Long Lake Cemetery is. It was straight up, so steep the boards that formed a seat across the wagon slid off. Mr. and Mrs. French got out. They wouldn't ride, but I just got the baby to sleep and said I'd rather ride. I sat down in the bottom of the wagon with little Emma in my arms and we started up. We got clear to the top and then the tongue came out of the wagon and down we went. I thought time had come, I thought my time had come, but before we got clear to the bottom, the wagon veered and stopped on two wheels. Mr. French got us fixed up and we built a smudge pot against the mosquitoes and ate our lunch. We were about three miles from home. Finally, we got to Wyzetta, where we got some rags and bound up Jerry's tail. We stayed all night there and got up at four the next morning and started on to Minneapolis. The story goes on. When you're stuck in rush hour, think about up and down the hills, the ox losing its tail, the tongue coming loose from the wagon and rolling down the hill. Hey, rush hour is a piece of cake. Thanks for letting me share a few of these stories. Have fun involving yourself with your local historical society. Thank mm -hmm. you.